Mario Bota, happy birthday to you. Um, this was the man when he was young. Uh, he studied at, in Venice at the University of Architecture in Venice. He had the chance to work together with a study with Carlos Scarpa. Well, he also worked with Luis Kahn, who had a great influence on him. And um, he built a lot. Here he is in, in uh, you know, later. And uh, he is also the founder of the School of Architecture in Mendrisio. He was born in Mendrisio. <clears throat> um, I, I found these, uh, these words <clears throat> about him. I don't know if they belong to him or they belong to a critic or someone who wrote about him between matter and memory. And I found it uh, rather uh, appropriate for his work between matter <clears throat> and memory. Mario Bota, born on April 1st, 1943, is a Swiss architect. We know this, and we read a little bit about him. Uh, Bota designed his first building, a two-family house at Morbio Superiore in Ticino at age 16. He graduated from the Università IUAV di Venezia, um, the only architecture university in Italy, while the arrangements of spaces in this structure uh, is inconsistent, its relationship to its site, separation of living from service spaces, and deep window recesses echo what would become his stark, strong, towering style. His designs tend to include a strong sense of geometry, often being based on very simple shapes, yet creating unique volumes of space. Uh, this is from Wikipedia. His buildings are often made of brick, yet his use of material is wide, varied, and often unique. Fra materia e memoria. This is the same uh, line that I read in English, but this is in Italian. Drawings, some drawings. I, 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 I didn't, uh, in the hurry to prepare this material, I didn't include his early drawings. I think he was drawing better when he was young than when he became older, maybe because he became tired of his own success. Uh, the drawings that he did later, like this one, um, are rather, you know, very quick sketches and... Uh, I, I personally don't find them very, very attractive um, graphically, but because I, I, that's how I start the presentation by showing also the drawings of the architect I, I, I am talking about. Uh, I included, uh, <clears throat> I included these drawings, uh, but these are drawings, uh, as I said, done later in his life. Uh, when he was young, he was influenced uh, a lot by um, Louis Kahn. Here he is uh, drawing uh, on some paper on the wall. Uh, uh, he loves to draw and draws manually, although in Mendrisio, the school funded by, founded by him, um, you know, they study uh, digital uh, technologies very early on from the first year. And it's, uh, it's not optional, you have to do it. Here he is uh, drawing a chair that he actually built uh, unfortunately, in this presentation, I do not show his uh, furniture designs. And uh, other sketches. We are going to see uh, this building later on. Now, the first construction of Mario Bota, about which I read um, just a few minutes ago, from 1961 to 1963, the parish house in Genestrelio, um, he, this is the house that he built when he was 16 years old, but he also built, and I imagine later, the facade for this church. And I like the facade very much. In fact, I like it more than, than some of his very celebrated uh, later buildings. But I don't know at what age he did this facade. But this house is the one he built and he mentioned at, at, building, at building it at, at 16. Somehow I like his early buildings more than his later buildings because his early buildings are yet unaffected by the, the mannerisms that uh, he himself uh, uh, generated. 
And this is the, the facade of, of this uh, church. I, I forgot how it is called. Um, I thought I, I mentioned the name, but anyway. It's very simple, uh, but it has, a, you know, uh, an artistic uh, doorway, which was not done by him, but by a sculptor. But I think the facade of the building is uh, impressive in its simplicity. In my opinion, he is better than Peter Zumthor in, in, this, in this particular instance. Bianchi House, uh, uh, Mario Botta, is a famous early house that he built. Uh, and uh, yes, he works with the simple geometries. Uh, and uh, but but the, conf the the crystallization of the spaces uh, uh, do leave space for uh, do create uh, the unexpected uh, um, you know uh, results. The landscape is magnificent. The, the architecture is, uh, you know, uh, uh, very clearly defined. But because of the large openings in the walls, it 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 uh, it, it connects with the outside. It's, it's not. It, it could have been very, you know, alien in the landscape. But because of those uh, large erosions, if I am to call them so. The prism uh, is uh, is uh, receiving and giving is is participating into what we call the environment and also the unusual uh, aspect that you enter the house at the top, not at the bottom. This also creates, you know, uh, so something distinct. Some echoes on the right, a little bit from uh, Carlos Scarpa. Uh, his professor or his um, tutor uh, at the University of uh, Architecture in Venice. At that time, at that time, he had a fresh vision, and his buildings were, um, you know, expressing this vision appropriately. But later on, I think uh, sometimes he became a little bit, um, uh, you know, uh, the prisoner of his own maniera. San Pietro House, 1979. Very often he has a, um, you know, a, a solid which he cuts in half. So you can see the two parts that uh, were um, disassociated, like here. It's, it's a rift between two parts, but, but there is also the hole, which is the, you know, the cube, almost the cube. This became a, a, you know, a signature, a trademark for uh, Mario Botta, a little, bit, um, a little bit tiring at times. He was very influenced by um, by Louis Kahn, but I think um, Louis Kahn is a superior architect. Although uh, Mario Botta has some some uh, remarkable achievements, and we are going to see some of them. I would think what differentiates Louis Kahn from Mario Botta is that, well, on one hand, one was the teacher and the other one the student so to speak, but more than this, I, I, I think uh, Mario Botta, has, despite the fact that he is very interested in uh, what is called the sacred, he does have a rather high level of, of the mundane in his work. And 
this could be problematic sometimes. But he did build some some uh, very convincing structures for for religion, for spirit, for the sacred. And maybe he was sort of doing his villas, you know, somehow, uh, you know, not necessarily inspired by Villa Rotonda of Palladio, although he has one himself that is called Rotonda, and we are going to see it. But the idealism of, 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 of that kind of architecture seems to animate him or animated him. And uh, not too many architects at that time and even today, or especially today, have a similar idealism. He believed in, in, uh, in, uh, in the solid architectural statements, but he tried to bring instability into the buildings through these um, sometimes unexpected cuts into the prism, into the prismatic silhouettes uh, of the building. Unfortunately, when I made this uh, PowerPoint presentation today, I couldn't find a satisfactory resolution for, for a number of pictures, and I apologize, like this one is 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 small, or this one. I I don't know. Either was something wrong with my uh, old laptop, or uh, I I I don't know, or with power uh, with a with a with a PowerPoint uh, uh, technology. But I just couldn't. Although they had uh, you know large dimensions on Google Images, but here that's all I got. So I apologize. Um, You'll see the same problem a little bit later. Anyway, as compared to the other buildings that surround this uh, building by uh, by Mario Botta, his building does have uh, an architect. The others, we are not sure. But in this case, we say, yes, it's the will of the architect. Maybe sometimes the will of the architect is too obvious a little bit, maybe. I don't know. But we see on the elevation on the left, uh, the upper uh, left, uh, and even here, you know, maybe because they became uh, so well known, these buildings by him, that, you know, they, they don't surprise any longer. It, they are a little bit uh, facile. They became, uh, you know, icons, and they don't uh, generate, uh, in my opinion, um, you know, uh, great surprise any longer. This is how the building looks from the back. Uh, sorry again for the small uh, resolution picture. And now Casa Rotonda, I mentioned in 1982. 1982 was the, was the year when, um, you know, the postmodern uh, Venice Biennial took place under the directorship of Paolo Portoghesi. And but but still the architecture of, uh, of uh, Mario Botta at that time was uh, was um, you know intriguing was uh, was was powerful was um, iconic. I mean he believed and he still believes in 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 in, in bricks in stones in organic materials. Maybe Patrick Schumacher was right that um, postmodernism and deconstructivism were two um, transitional um, um, styles, so to speak. You know, first were the number of modernism, then in the late, in the, in the later part of the 20th century, postmodernism, and deconstruction, and then after after these transitional substyles or styles, I forgot how Patrick Schumacher calls them, follows um, parametricism with its own, you know, substyles. The last one a few years ago being tectonism. But Mario Botta never left the solidity of what he believed in for the seductions, sometimes violent, violently so, or sometimes, 
you know, mimicked in a seductive way of deconstruction. And nor was his postmodernism, um, you know, highly nostalgic in the sense that he didn't borrow stylistic elements from history. So I wouldn't say that his buildings are historicist. They are not. But there is, uh, there is a connection with postmodernism, and that's why there are articles about him, uh, you know, where some of his buildings are placed within the context of um, what we call postmodernism. But it's not that postmodernism um, of nostalgia that uh, animated the many disenchanted souls at the end of the 20th century. No, he still believed in, um, in you know, an abstraction, in a strong uh, geometry, and uh, he didn't employ, you know, borrowed columns from I don't know what era and so on. In my opinion, it's a little bit regrettable that the, the staircase uh, externalizes itself in this way, uh, rather convenient and a, a little bit uh, predictably. Um, you know, it's it could have done more, but I think, considering the purity of the cylinder. cylinder. The Church San Giovanni Battista and Monio in Switzerland, 1996, we saw some drawings of it. Now we see the building. Uh, there is heavy masonry here. Some people would uh, would say that it's too heavy for our time, but who knows? Who knows? Uh, maybe not. May, but but we remember those words between matter and memory. Uh, we here we see both matter and memory. We also see ornament. Um, he's not afraid to 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 bring sensitivity to his masonry walls through graphic means which are ornamental in nature. He obviously believes in architecture in a, in a way in which maybe not too many of us still do. We are going to see a number of churches uh, built by him because he did build, he did build a lot. In, in the field of what he calls the sacred. I would be hesitant a little bit to use this word sacred because like the word love, if it's too employed, it becomes weaker actually. But to replace it with what? It's a question. Again, sorry for the resolution of these pictures. I just couldn't find them bigger or I couldn't make them bigger unless I, you know, I blew them up, but uh, losing the sharpness of the lines. 
So this is the section through the through the through the building. It's a small chapel. It's a small building, but still monumental. And the interesting plan, employing the ellipse towards the outside and then inside the rectangle. Um, we are going to see a little bit later a church, well, an homage to Boromini, who also employed the, the ellipse in uh, San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane. And here it is, San Carlino Church, built in 1999, and I think he had a very seductive idea to reproduce in wood half of the church built in Rome by Boromini, that is San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane, and this is why it's called San Carlino Church. He simply cut it in half, and I think he uh, created something... Uh, uh, memorable. Uh, it was done again as an homage to Boromini. Uh, I don't know exactly on what occasion. It was probably a, an important commemorative year, 1999. Uh, maybe this is Lake Lugano in Switzerland. And this is the, the homage of uh, Mario Botta to the great Baroque architect Boromini, Francesco Boromini who ended his life by committing suicide, I think a 67 or 68. He's enchanted by life and perhaps his rivalry with Bernini. It looks uh, very, uh, you know, uh, provocative, uh, especially from the side, because you see clearly it's cut in half. And yes, again, between matter and memory. Mario Botta. He simply reproduced you know, the details, uh, the architectural configuration of what Bor Boromini did in Rome, but in wood. I think it is a very good work. But the drawings, the drawings are probably expressing very intimately the time we are in. The idealism or ideality of Boromini, not to mention Bernini, and that time, uh, you know, is uh, are probably difficult to sustain these days. That's why very important architects today draw almost disenchanted drawings, like these sketches by Mario Botta. I wonder what he felt, what he thought when he made these nervous sketches. This is not how Boromini drew. This is the 20th century or the 21st century, the 20th century. But this was the idea to cut in half, you know, the 
the interior of the building uh, by Borromini in Rome. And with the help of um, digital um, uh, technology, this became feasible and it was done. And I, I salute it as a, as, as a good work. I mean, how else to express your homage towards uh, Borromini? You couldn't compete with him, but in an original way, Mario Botta succeeded in, uh, in uh, showing uh, uh, both uh, affection and, uh, and distance somehow. And in a way, it's a meditation on, on life itself, because we are all born to die and we are all accompanied by a shadow, which at the end becomes vertical while we become horizontal. I don't know if I <laughs> expressed uh, properly uh, uh, what I wanted to say. Chapel of Mount Tamaro in Switzerland, Santa Maria degli Angeli, this is how it is called, this chapel. Uh, and it's one of his best works, in my opinion. It's built with stones in a magnificent landscape. And uh, it's, 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 it's a powerful work. And we see again the duality of his architecture, the... the the two-ness, if I am to use this word, left, right, and then the rift in between them. Stone, stone, and stone again. Maybe these uh, steps are a little bit uh, mechanical. He employs uh, such elements uh, sometimes, but the way he, he configured this building, I think, is, uh, is, uh, is a success. Uh, very much held by the magnificent landscape, of course. It's literally a building between the earth and the sky. I'm unhappy with these images, but uh, as I said, uh, I, I had no choice. The interior is, is rather uh, surprising and very courageous, I would say, with, with its level of abstraction and the presence of blackness and wood. It's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's an interior which doesn't leave you indifferent. Not being on this uh, terrace, I think, uh, leaves you indifferent. It's impossible contemplating those mountains and the sky. Is it a Zarathustrian uh, statement? I don't know. I mean, it is very ample. Uh, you know, that stone brought there, it's... Um, it's not really a, an ecological building. It's not a building which asserts uh, eco values. It's it's assertive still of uh, of man, but a man who cannot live without something higher than him. 
this is the this is the plan but sorry again it's it's a small picture An equally small section. Longitudinal. And here is the building from the side. This is, I think, a very moving uh, picture. You know, it's it's re really like 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 walking towards the infinite. This image makes me think a little bit of uh, Massimo Scolari, whom I presented the other day. But Scolari didn't build the visions he expressed through his drawings, but Mario Botta built. La Chiesa del Santo Volto, I left this in uh, Italian, somehow I like the Italian in this case more. Uh, it's in Torino, in Italy, uh, and uh, I think it's, 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 it's a good building. Another church by um, this architect who is not at all indifferent to what we call the sacred, Uh, sometimes he's uh, capable of creating these um, surprising interiors through unexpected manipulations of the of the geometrical uh, forms. Torino, Torino, which has great um, church architecture, uh, as we know from uh, some of the architects we talked about here on Zoom. Now a synagogue and the Jewish Heritage Center, uh, Symbolista Synagogue uh, in Tel Aviv. The Symbolista Synagogue and Jewish Heritage Center is a cultural center and the main synagogue of Tel Aviv University, 
It was designed in 1996 by uh, Mario Botta and constructed from 1997 to 1998. has a few echoes of, uh, not towards the outside, but if we see the section of um, the, the unbuilt uh, synagogue by Louis Kahn in uh, Jerusalem. And there are other echoes from, uh, from uh, Louis Kahn here. Again, I, I'm exasperated by by these uh, drawings, and I, I I couldn't I couldn't solve this problem. Particularly, this section makes me think of the uh, synagogue uh, project done by Louis Kahn for uh, Jerusalem, which was not built, unfortunately. I think one day someone has to build that building, just as uh, someone built or some people built. Uh, Saint Pierre de Firmini were by Le Corbusier after he died. Now, what is that silhouette? I don't know if he did this drawing or in his office, but I wonder why he used the you know the paradigmatic uh, Le Corbusier's uh, little man, but muscular, little but muscular in in these sections. I'm not sure uh, it was needed. Anyway, maybe they are not his drawings or his office. Uh, every cathedral in every in France, a uh, large building, yes, it's a cathedral with an unusual uh, you know, uh, crown of trees at the top. Here again, we see some echoes of a staircase done by uh, Louis Kahn for the Yale um, uh, Art Gallery, but at a much larger, larger scale. Hard to see this. Um, sorry, I'm referring to this, but it looks like it's not a circle. It's an ellipse, but maybe it is a circle. It, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, understand from this. Um, Throwing, but echoes from uh, Louis Kahn uh, are all very obvious. Uh, but less obvious are, uh, you know, uh, what we see outside. And uh, yes, this, uh, I don't know, at first I didn't like it, this crown of trees, you know, but I don't know. I still have to think about it. It's uh, it's an architecture that uh, I think uh, I think uh, in, in in many of his works, even those dedicated to, to what we call the sacred, Mario Botta uh, couldn't quite get rid of some um, touches of uh, of the mundane. Somehow, I have the feeling. Or maybe I should say it's it's about the the graphic aspect of his architecture, which is uh, present. He's working with tectonics. He's convincing using bricks and 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 uh, stones, but sometimes uh, he's not sufficiently surprising. For example, I think that Sigurd Leverens in Sweden is more surprising with a much more modest building where he employs uh, bricks in very poetical ways. Mario Botta could be a little bit graphic in the negative sense, but there is also, there are, there are positive aspects of his architecture, like even this section, that curvature there is, uh, is rather unexpected. Uh, I, again, I'm not very sure about that crown of, uh, of trees at the top. Is it an homage to nature to torture the trees to be aligned like this, you know, um, at the top of the building and to grow from probably concrete? I don't know. I don't know if it's the greatest affection for trees that we can show. Again, we see the employment of brick 
not neglecting ornament. And now the Watari Museum in Japan, I wanted to include also a building uh, that is neither ho a house nor um, you know, a church. And it is in Japan. It's a museum of contemporary art in Tokyo. And I think it's very, uh, somehow he was able to remain himself and also evoke somehow Japan. I think he, he did a good job at avoiding, uh, you know, using his paradigmatic uh, brick aesthetics, red brick. And here we have, a, it's still a Mario Bota building, but adapted to the Japanese context, to Tokyo. And yes, this facade is a little bit predictable because we already talked about it. You know, here you have the rift between the left side and the right side. It's a trademark, or it's a signature element in his architecture. But somehow uh, he honored the context, the Japanese context, Tokyo, uh, appropriately. Now, maybe that banner there looks a little bit strange, but maybe that's exactly what the building needed in order to escape uh, maybe the excesses of something too solemn, maybe. Okay, and now a work in Austria, which um, puzzled me. Because for someone who is uh, truly concerned about spirituality and about what he himself calls often the sacred, this building uh, is too acrobatic and too, in a way, simplistically acrobatic. And uh, I don't think spirit truly needs something like this. Like if I compare this with a very modest chapel that Lina Bobardi built in Brazil, here I see a, an, um, you know, um, yes, an acrobatic architecture that uh, is a little bit too showy, in my opinion. I mean, does spirit need this uh, rotation of the cube, you know, this, um, you know, uh, exhibitionism, this, um, you know, uh, uh, extravagant uh, gesture, I, I don't think he does. But that's what he thought of doing and that's what he did. I personally do not think spirit needs something like this. Not to mention the very explicit uh, borrowings from uh, Konstantin Brunkush in, Tur in Turgujiu, you know, the chairs, the seating that, that are, you know, almost identical with what Brunkush did. As I said earlier, uh, there is this um, graphic aspect of his architecture, which could be a little bit facile sometimes. 
and the little Colvisian men everywhere. If indeed this belongs to, I'm not sure if if if, if this representation, uh, this section belongs to his office or to him. But we we, we saw many times this uh, Corbusian uh, human profile, didn't we? I like this picture. Unfortunately, I like it because of the contrast. You know, look at the at the fence, the wooden fence, and then we see the mountaineers, mountaineers, and then we see the building by by Mario Botta. But unfortunately, we see we see all of them in this small picture, uh, which is exasperatingly uh, not enough. Sorry about this. Um, so here it is. I. I I almost feel like saying that I like more the fence than the building, which the fence has now was probably not built by him and has no artistic or architectonic ambitions, but he needs modesty, I think, and he needs non-architecture uh, is uh, somehow uh, more conducive, I think, uh, to believing that there is something higher than us while the rotated cube uh, of his architecture seems to say there is nothing higher than us, meaning human beings. So it's still an image of Anthropos, of, a, of an Anthropos who needs a little bit to be tamed, I would say. Anyway, um, but he's still uh, very capable of... Uh, um, you know, creating uh, these uh, geometries that, uh, you know, with simple means, he is able to create sometimes uh, unexpected, uh, unexpected results. But the drawing also shows some, uh, some anxiety, I would say. If I am to psychoanalyze the drawing, you know, where the stairs are, I see some uh, nerv nervousness there. And now, in order to puzzle you, in as much as I was puzzled, here we have a casino built by, by this architect who is dedicated uh, to, to the sacred. Now, what does the casino have to do with God or with, uh, you know, with, uh, with faith, with uh, spirit? It's the very opposite, no? But you are going to see a casino which is, uh, I mean, we know it is a casino, but but if it was named a cathedral, we would have believed it. Here it is. And this confuses me, you know, because someone who really searches for spirit, in my opinion, cannot build such a triumphalist casino. I mean, you know, as uh, Charles Baudelaire in that beautiful short poem in prose says, when he's asked by someone who interviews him, so to speak, do you believe in, 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 in gold, meaning money? And the, and the poet says, I hate it in as much as you hate God. In other words, Charles Baudelaire created the, the absolute disjunction, opposition between money, meaning gold, and God. But here we see the architect of God, the architect of spirit, the architect of the sacred, building a casino, which, which could have been considering its, um, you know, uh, a dramatic appearance, it could have been a church or it could have been a cathedral, but it's a casino and this confuses me. I am very sorry, uh, Mr. Botta, I wish you happy birthday today, but I am confused. Are you for spirit or are you for casinos? He built it and he built it in this way and uh, this confuses me. And look at it. It could have been a cathedral. And if I was to talk in uh, confrontational terms, I would have said it's the cathedral of money, of uh, speculative, uh, you know, uh, 
enterprises um, having to do with money. I mean, you know, that's what a casino is. And Mr. Trump, who was just indicted, should know something about casinos because he owns casinos. And I know myself what a casino is because I once lo lost a little bit of money playing roulette in my midlife crisis. So I know what a casino is. It has nothing to do with God or spirit. It's the very opposite. It's the, it's the place of dissolution, of uh, psychological disintegration. I know that Dostoevsky himself was addicted in Switzerland, uh, you know, uh, to, to playing because, uh, you know, artists and uh, creators often have problems with money. And you think that, uh, you know, uh, a casino could solve your problems once and for all and very, very quickly. And this is actually the main uh, subject of that beautiful, beautiful short story by Alexander Pushkin, the Queen of Spades. So maybe, maybe this is a subject to 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 uh, address, you know, uh, God and the casino, the sacred and the casino. But it does disturb me the triumphalism of the structure that both are built for this function. Is it less dramatic than his churches? No, it is not. Maybe it's even more dramatic. So it's almost like saying, you know, um, gold is more important than what we get if we eliminate letter L. Not gold, but gold. The casino. Proclaiming the power, the seductions, the madness of its majesty, money, and earning as quickly as possible, as much as possible. The casino. Mario Bota. Seen from the side. The true architectural king of the place. The beautiful landscape. Did that landscape need this giant casino? I don't think so. And here it is. The interior. I wonder what he felt. This builder, builder of many churches and chapels, some of them inspired, when he did this. I really wonder what he felt and thought. I almost hear in my ears now the noise of the coins falling, falling, giving the illusion of the players that will, they will rule the world. Somebody told me that in a casino, they increase the percentage of ozone to give you the, the feeling of omnipotence. So you would lose all your money there because that's what the casino is made for, actually. They only give you the illusion of earning anything. And now the church that we saw, but maybe it's a relationship. I, I, I end with some question marks. We see here the interior of the casino. We see here the exterior of, of this chapel or church that is um, extravagantly uh, showing off. And then we see this, which was also done by the same architect. And I think it, it is a good work, a positive work. Maybe, maybe, maybe this uh, long passage towards the, the chapel is a little bit too massive, but considering the, 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 the majestic landscape, uh, maybe it was appropriate. Maybe. And this is the last picture of this imperfect and uh, rather short presentation with Mario Botta as a, as a man who probably is not too unhappy about himself and his accomplishments. Um, I don't know.
But his drawings, if we are to psychoanalyze them a little bit, show a little bit something else, I would say. Anyway, happy, happy birthday to you, uh, Mario Botta, and thank you. <laughs>